Good evening and welcome once again to the Marty Heiser Show. We're so glad you joined us. We're coming to you absolutely free of charge. All you have to do is turn on your TV and boom, here you are, free entertainment. And you know, it is the Marty Heiser Show where you always get the truth. I have a producer that says, I need to say that every time. But you know that. You always get the truth. And you know how come you know you always get the truth? Because I'm not getting paid any money for this. And I don't think I can ever be, like, canceled. It's not really, uh, I don't know how many viewers we really have for this show, but I'm pretty sure no one's ever going to cancel me. So you know what we get to do? We get to sit here around this wood table and talk about stuff that interests me. And you know what interests me? Minor league baseball here in Danbury. And what interests me even a little bit more is minor league ho pro hockey here in Danbury. You know we're talking about the Danbury Whalers. So tonight, it's wall-to-wall -wall athletes around here. We have Jack Deering joining us from the Danbury Westerners. They're the uh, college-level minor league baseball team. You'll see him around, especially in the summer, and he's going to be talking about minor league baseball. And we have Phil Esposito. No, not the hulking guy for the Boston Bruins. This is like third or fourth generation Phil Esposito, but he's the uh, effervescent coach of the Danbury Whalers, and he's going to talk about the team that now is 15 and 15 but they're starting their playoff push. I've seen this before. They peak right at the right time, and that's what you need in minor pro hockey. So we're going to be talking about that. First, I just want to say briefly, because we, of course, all realize we had a tragedy that happened right in our community. And I don't want to um, stretch it out or, 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 or become too focused, but I just want the folks in Sandy Hook and the folks in Newtown to know that it's nothing that anyone has forgotten. Just this past week, uh, different things have come up. First responders actually ran out with the New England Patriots at their playoff game. They led the team out onto the field. I'm on the Board of Finance in Ridgefield, and the Board of Ed is working on their security program. And we're seeing how much this is going to cost. And we're saying, you know what? Whatever it costs, whatever we need to do, whatever lessons are learned, we're going to secure the schools and make sure that, that they're right. Um, Everything, uh, even uh, uh, hockey players, hockey teams have put uh, uh, stickers on their helmets. Uh, people, the NFL football players are doing the same thing. Everyone is trying to do anything we possibly can to let you know that we're with you. We can only imagine the pain that you're going through as a community, but we're going to stay with you. We're going to get through this together, and our hearts just go out to you. They really do. So we're with you. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. I know at our church, I go to Walnut Hill Community Church, there have been uh, um, activities there also regarding that. And then, of course, there was this huge concert. Uh, the Webster Bank Arena in Bridgeport was sold out this past Tuesday night. Uh, Christian artists from around the country came in, all in the hopes of healing and doing what we can to make sure that we get through this and we get through it together. You're not standing alone. We're with you. Life is going to go on, and, and our hearts just go out to you. And maybe the news and the press have left, but we're right here, and we're going to get this right, and we're going to make sure nothing like this ever happens again. So we just wanted to know that and wanted to make a sort of a shout-out to everyone in this community, and we're going to stand with you. Okay, switching gears. I have my new best friend in the world. Jack Deering, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I really appreciate being here. Now, now you, your participation in the Danbury Westerners, you are not the president or the chief executive officer. What are you to the Danbury Westerners? I'm director of baseball operations, and I'm a member of the board. Okay, now, I've gotten to know you just a little bit, and you played a little ball in your day, too. You were uh, part of the uh, Braves minor league system back in uh, 1920, 1930. No. <laughs> 1955, um, I was with West Palm Beach in the Florida State League, and uh, unfortunately, I never got out of spring training because I tore one of the quads in my right thigh going from first to third. And, you know, in those days, we had no trainers, we had no helmets, we had wool uniforms. Steroids were hard to come by? There were no steroids. No steroids? Uh -huh. No. I mean, you didn't even think of them. All you cared about is being on the roster and having a uniform. You didn't care how much money you made or what. So how old were you when you played in the West Palm Beach League? 19. 19 years old. So you're 19 years old. You're on these rickety buses. You're going from venue to venue. You're playing baseball. They're even paying you a few shekels. Were you on top of the world? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just to make the minor leagues is an achievement in itself. Never mind the big show. So now... Do you sense a little bit? Because when you talk about the Danbury Westerners, these are actually college kids. 
that play their college baseball at, at whatever venue they're playing college baseball at, and then there's a certain period of time during the summer where they can come and play in this league here, and are they chasing their baseball dream as well, a little bit like you what, down in West Palm Well, Beach? I mean, most of them are chasing their baseball dreams, but a, a lot of them like to play the game, and they're looking ahead as becoming businessmen. Mm -hmm. And I'm just as interested in them becoming successful businessmen as I am for them to become successful players. So do you feel like you're a bit of a life coach too? Do you mentor some of these kids? Do you have some of them live with them? And, and when I talk to them, some of them actually live and are billeted in some of the homes in town. Oh, we, we have great host families. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a tremendous amount of great host families, okay? And they house these players and, and uh, the players uh, become great friends of theirs. And, um, and you ever hear No More Garcia Pera? Sure. Well, on ESPN, as a commentator, he related to when he played in Cape Cod and how great the host family was, and that today they're still great friends. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Now, you know, you talk about it. What, the, the name of the league that the Westerners play in is? New England, Colle New England Collegiate Baseball League. Okay, so these are all college students. That's a prerequisite. All college players from Division One, Two, and Three colleges and universities. Okay, you know, we had a... Uh, uh, back when they, you remember Shea Stadium back before they had City Field. Oh, God, yes. Uh, back in the day when my kids were a little younger, we, uh, we would get some box seat tickets. We didn't have the whole, you know, season tickets, but I had a friend and uh, we would buy about 10 or 12 games. You go down there, four seats, parking, hot dogs, heaven forbid someone wants a beverage. I mean, it gets a little pricey. I've been to some of these Western games, and I know we're non commercial uh, public access radio here. But, uh, my gosh, you can get in and out and, and, and still have change back from your 20. It's the cheapest game in town. And, and it's up close and personal, but these guys play good baseball. Well, I'll give you an example. I signed three players from Maris last year. Mm -hmm. Zach Shank, a shortstop, Mike Orifice, first base, and Brett Halseal, teased, and, and Brett right. Halseal, a pitcher. Uh -huh. Okay? Zach Shank was voted the third, by perfect game, the third best shortstop in all of the collegiate leagues in the country. Wow. And he's in the top 10 prospects. Wow. Okay. And he's a senior at Marist this year. Wow. So now you've had, you've had players from your organization graduate into the big leagues, haven't you? Can you list some of them? Well, we're, right now, I, I met Mike Olt, OLT. He played for UConn, right. and he's with the Texas Rangers. They brought him up last August, wow. and, and he's prime time. Yeah, and they're playing right here in our backyard, right over by the War Memorial. And what's your season? What's, what's the, the months that you play? Well, our season starts roughly around June 7th, mm -hmm. okay, and, and it runs through August 1st or 2nd, and then if you're in the playoffs, it gets over by August 15th. So it's about what, about a, a two-month season? Well, it's, like a, it's a two-month, and if you get in the playoffs, it's 10 weeks. And the, the playoffs are 10 weeks. Well, no, no, all no, no, oh, sorry. <laughs> the total is 10 weeks. Okay. Now, because they, I mean, they have to get back, you know, to college and university. All right. Okay, now, you graduated from Norwalk High School, 1953, or thereabouts, the, the, the illustrious class of 53. Yeah. Played a little baseball there, went down to Florida, played in the West Palm Beach. Well, League. I, went, I went in the Air Force first. Is that right? Oh, yeah. How long were you in the Air Force? Well, I was in the Air Force from 1951. I quit school. Okay. to go in the Air Force so I could play baseball. Commendable, commendable. Okay. Like, education's and, 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 overrated. Well, well, no, no, and I promised my mother to get my GED, and uh -huh. I did. Okay. okay. You know, but the, the, the biggest thing that meant to me was to play with players better than me because that's the way you improve. Right. right. And I played in the Southwestern Semi-Pro Tournament, and then I played for a team in El, in El Paso City League. And, you know, I got invited to the Braves minor league spring training camp in Wake Forest, Georgia in 1953, and I took a 30-day leave to go there. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, look, I mean, you, you have a baseball resume. You've got some knowledge. And then you come and, you, and you, you end up starting out as a fan, like 2008, 2009 of the Westerners. But you, you uh, become part of the team, and you actually became the outfield bench coach. Is that right? Yeah, 2010, 2011. Because I was the outfield bench coach for Torrington Twisters in the same league uh -huh. in, in 2000 and 2001, huh. okay? 
Now, now, when you when you're coaching these guys, what is it that you want to get across to them? I mean, if you're Pete Rose, it's all about hustle. Uh, if you're Nolan Ryan, it's all about the fastball. What do you try to impart to these young men? Well, you see, I'm old school, mm-hmm. and preparation is everything, and playing pepper is everything. Pepper is a lost start. Yeah. Because back in my day, okay, you played pepper for two and three hours because... Now for, for the youngsters out there, if, if all of you youngsters could just briefly put down your video game, just put it down just for one second. Now, Jack, would you share with these youngsters that really don't get off the couch long enough and put down their video game, tell them what a game of pepper is all about because you may have lost them. Go ahead. Well, pepper is, is uh, three guys at a minimum, okay? Mm-hmm. Two fielding and one hitting. And they, they start out playing 21. If you field 21 balls, then you get to hit. And then the game goes to 15, and it gets more progressive. It's the fundamentals. All right. And Hand then, out of coordination. And, and, and then, on the ball. That, Quick reaction. And then the game goes to 11, and then it really gets hot. You can't get that playing and, video. And, and you know, back in those days, we used to have fastball fights. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Starting down at 120 feet, and then coming in closer. You and know. you just chuck the ball at each other as hard as you just possibly could. Just chuck the ball as hard as you could. Boy, that's when Americans were Americans, you know what I mean? Yeah. P. Rowe, should he be in the uh, Hall of Fame or not? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Betting on baseball for Bolton? Absolutely not. Right. What about Ty Cobb? What are your thoughts on him? Well, I wasn't around for when Ty Cobb played. <laughs> he wasn't here too. And I wasn't around when Shoeless Joe Jackson played, you All know? Right. Well, Ty Cobbs is in is in uh, the Hall of Fame, but I guess well, he was one of the twelve originals. Yeah, he got in on the first ballot. It's a bit of a crazy guy, though. I don't know. I saw. Well, if you if you watch the movie Cobb, I did. (laughs) I was watching the other night. I I only watched his mother shot his father because the father was snooping on the mother because they thought that the mother was fooling around. Right. The mother thought, allegedly, he was a predator or some sort of uh, peeping Tom shot him twice. No. My model is Enos Slaughter. Enos be- Slaughter. Because Enos Country Slaughter because I was an outfielder. And, uh, y- you know, the story on him was that uh, he would run in from the outfield. And when he got to the third base foul line, then he walked to the dugout. Yeah. So the manager said, you know, Enos, if you're tired, I, you know, I can put somebody else in. Right. And, and that was the end of it. He hustled every time. He, he ran out of the dugout, and he ran back to the dugout. You know? There you go. I grew up with Cubs fan, Ernie Banks, let's play two. Ron Sano, and, uh, Don Kessinger, Glenn Becker, and Ernie Banks, Randy Huntley, not Todd Huntley, that was his son. Ferguson Jenkins on the mound, still haven't won. It's been a, it's been 100 years, but we're, a, we're about to break through. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, Danbury Westerners. You have a hot stove breakfast coming up. All these festivities are happening February 9th and February 10th. Tell us about that. Well, fe- February 9th is the first annual hot stove breakfast because hot stove means winter baseball. Right. Okay? And Can what- I just break it down for the kids with the video games? Hot stove baseball is basically back in the day, before, dare I say, MTV and all these video games, guys used to sit around the hot stove because it's winter, and they would talk baseball, and they'd say well, who we need to trade and what we need to get and what we need as a relief pitcher, and this would go on and on forever. So that's what the hot stove thing is. And, and, and what I want to accomplish being director of baseball operations, being a member of the board, we're having it at two steps, and we can only have 70 people, okay? Okay. And what I, want, what I want to accomplish is to try and get the most successful businessmen and women in Western Connecticut to come, get board members to come, mm-hmm. parents to come, you know, and demonstrate how good this organization really is. Mm. And w- when I'm starting with the first annual Hot Stove Breakfast, is my guest speaker, my lead speaker, is Chris Traz, the head baseball coach at Marist College. Wow. Okay? Mm-hmm. Because I, I want to stay within 150 miles of Danbury and invite every year a head baseball coach from a college or university mm-hmm. so he can see what kind of an organization we are and send his best players there. There you go. So it's all about, you know, building those it, it, networks? It's all, it's all networking and it's all building... And it's public relations. Mm-hmm. Now, by the way, just I want to pick it up. Graduated Norwalk, 
went served your country admirably, uh, played a pretty high level minor league baseball. With well, the class D, to... class D was not high level. It was the bottom of the barrel. Jack, work with me here, would you, Jack? I'm trying to build you up. We're uh, you know trying to get. But then you went on and you had a very successful career in land use development, and you were a very successful businessman. Yes, and, and, and I'm very fortunate at 78 to still be working because I have a couple of projects in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I write and produce educational programs that I teach in, in a variety of universities and colleges and continuing ed and private sector. All right, so you're not, you're not in this for the money, the Danbury Westerners. No. How do they pay? If I was to double your pay, how much would you still be making? Zero. There you go. So you go on double it. You, you need a raise. Okay, so on September... September 9th, and by the way, if you Google the Danbury Westerners, they have a wonderful website. A lot of these things uh, are going to be on the schedule. Oh, and I see they have the phone number up, too. If you have a question, do it quick. And if you have a question, don't hesitate to call in 438-2003, and that number will also be up for uh, Phil Esposito later in the program. Um, but Saturday, February 9th at Two Steps is where they're having the hot stove breakfast. It's going to be 9 to 12. Double no, check. 8 to 12. I'm sorry, 8, 8 to 12. To 12. Right. Double check on the, uh, on the website. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a, we have a program here. Yeah. Is that what we have? Okay, we're going to hold that up. Yeah, there we go. Uh, hot stove breakfast. It's going to be uh, 8 to 12 at Two Steps. And then the following day, I like how they uh, put this together. There's going to be a 5K race. A 5K race is going to be uh, on February 10th, starting at approximately 9.30. And that's going to be followed up with a chili fest. It's a little bit like the turkey trot right before, uh, right before Thanksgiving. You run 5K and you think you can Well, go. you know, this, I mean, this chili fest is huge every year. Okay. Because you get, tw you know, you get at least 25 contestants. Right. And then they're competing for the best chili. There you go. All right, yeah. so this is like a contest. And yeah, yeah, it's like a contest and, and, and it's a nice afternoon. Excellent, excellent. So that's going to be on February 10th. All right, now. Don't take this the wrong way, and I don't want to, you know, create a problem or anything. But I, I, I did get out to a couple of these uh, uh, games this past uh, this past summer, and uh, I have a 26-year-old daughter and a 20-year-old daughter, and they came out and they brought their friends. We actually had some visiting. Uh, there was a young lady from Illinois who was about 19, and and they met some of the ball players, and they thought that they were very handsome, very athletic. What is that like? What goes on uh, at these games? Is there a chance to meet some of these players? And, and, and uh, would that bring out the young ladies? Well, you know, it, it's very difficult because they get there at 3.30, quarter to 4. Right. And they have to get ready for the game. Right. And then they have to have, you know, uh, 20 minutes or a half hour to eat. Right. And then they start getting ready for the game again. So public relations... Pre-game is very difficult. What we try to do is is to generate public relations after the game. Okay. So maybe after the game, after the victory, and by the way, the team has been very successful in the past few years, haven't they? Well, yes. In 2010, we were within two innings of winning the New England championship, right. okay, with the uh, Navigators, okay, and, and then in 2011, we got beat in the first round, and then 2012, we played against Newport for the New England Championship, but we just didn't have the pitching to compete with them. We had everything else, but not the pitching. Could be kind of like the Buffalo Bills of uh, minor collegiate pro uh, minor league baseball, huh? Well, getting to the show, but not quite getting it done. Well, hey, li hey listen, y you know, every, everything is preparation and everything is practice and everything is, is focusing on the game when it's played. Yeah. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for coming in. I've been to your games. It's, it's a really great community feeling out there. It's very reasonably priced, and these guys can play. I mean, you're watching some future major leaguers out there, and it's up close and personal, and uh, we really appreciate you being part of the community. I, I'm, I want to thank you kindly for having me and really appreciate it. Please come back. I, I want to get one of these windbreakers. You guys got the coolest hats, too. Well, we'll, we'll get you something. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Right. Appreciate you coming in. That was my guest, Jack Deering. He is uh, head of baseball operations. He's pretty much everything at, uh, at the Danbury Westerners Baseball League, but he's not the president, okay? So the president out there, 
Uh, and, and, you know, I just want you to know he doesn't claim to be the president. So he's not the president. And I'm telling you, it is a wonderful day. It's very family oriented. You go out there, the kids are there. They have all kinds of, you know, giveaways and fun things for the kids to do. And it's really fun. And really, I mean, all kidding aside, with all these video games and everything like that, I think these kids need to, you know, start playing a little more sports, get out of the house, fill their lungs with oxygen, and uh, and have some fun. It certainly worked out well for Jack Deering, and I want to thank him very, very much for uh, for joining us. Okay. Next up, for those of you in the Danbury area, a man who needs no introduction, uh, we're joined by Phil Esposito, the coach of the Danbury Whalers, and we're going to put, this is uh, Danbury Whalers colors, and it's interesting that you have Kirshner up there because he is just rejoining the team. Yeah, he, he just resigned, just came back. I just picked up his jersey today, actually, because we're leaving tomorrow morning for a road trip, so I needed it, uh, okay. needed it to come with, come with us right. tomorrow morning. And we are we are joined as well by Desiree uh, Adden Adden Olfi. Adden Olfi. Adden Olfi. It's not an Irish name. It's, no, uh, it's Italian. Actually, there's a lot of it. I can see what's going on here. A lot of Italians. But and you are the Danbury Whaler sideline reporter. Yes, sir. So anyone who's been to the game, you're the one that boldly goes out onto the ice, grabs one of these hulking, uh, uh, you know, hockey players, and goes, "What what happened in that second period?" And then they get an interview right there. All right. And how did you how did you come to join the the Whalers, and how have you enjoyed working there? Um, well, I, this isn't my first gig in the sports industry. I worked for the New Jersey Devils. I started out as an ice girl. Worked in, okay. for the New Jersey Nets for game operations. I mm. met the CEO Herm Swisher. He offered me the position for a sideline reporting. I couldn't refuse it. I'm passionate about Herm. Hockey. Good eye for talent. Yep. He's no joke. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Passionate about the sport, passionate about hockey, um, just really loving what I do. The Whalers have been an amazing organization to work for. It's been a great experience. Now, for those of you, you know, it's funny. I talked to people, oh, who do you have on the show? And I said, well, Phil Esposito. And they go, oh, that minor league hockey, oh, that's pretty rough. And I try to tell them, I, I mean, I've been to scores of games. Um, they're actually going to let me do the radio thing on Saturday. I know, I heard. This is a little, you know, we're going to get into some old-time hockey. And, You're anyway. an old pro, though. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how that all works out. <laughs> I'll add it to my resume. But um, uh, it's really, I mean, dare I say, a family-oriented evening out at the at the Danbury Ice Arena, and and you're a big part of that. It seems like it's a real family. As field. long as you avoid Section 102, it's very family oriented. <laughs> now, when she says Section 102, there's one section that has an identity all onto its own, and if the goalie from the opposing team lets in a goal, <coughs> let's just say they're not that concerned about that goalie's self-esteem. Uh, they will do chants and so forth to try and uh, you know lower lower that guy's uh, uh, confidence. Uh, that's Section 102. But anyway, all right, let's talk hockey. I could talk hockey all the time. I know you could. As a matter of fact, when are we going to have another Phil Esposito show at some of these various watering holes? We, I don't know. We, we lost our, our director of media operations there, Marco Serino, last year, who set that up all the time. And, My, an Ivy League grad, I know, Marco. I know. And, um, you know, so I, I think I've put, put it out there a few times, mm -hmm. and we kind of got working on it, and then some things happened, and I got busy doing some other stuff, and we just haven't had an opportunity to do it yet. But hopefully... In the second half of the year here, we can we can get that underway and, and get you back out into the nightlife where you like to be. So you know, I don't really get out that much. My wife's here in the studio and she keeps me on a pretty short leash. Yeah. It's a lot of microwave popcorn and let's watch a romantic <laughs> comedy on TV. That's the extent of my life. You know, my I, extent of my life is on a bus right now. So <laughs> that's it. You know, I was in. I went to the rink uh, last weekend. You were playing the Danville Dashers. And I'm like, how, damn, they drove all the way out here. The bus had Illinois plates. I yeah. mean, that's a ride to Dan. It's a long ride. Yeah. The last time we went out there, we played on a Thursday night. We left right after the game at home here and drove to Danville because we played there the next night. You drove from here in one in one fell swoop and ready to skate the we next night? We left at midnight. Wow. We left at midnight and drove all night and got into the hotel the next day around uh, lunchtime, checked in the hotel, had a couple of hours of sleep, and then played a game that night. So. Wow. wow. Well, listen, it's a little bit like the Danbury Westerners. These, these guys that are out there playing put their heart and soul into what they're doing. You go out to these, I'm telling you, this is very high-level competitive hockey. I and mean, these are guys that have played on Division I college teams. They've played in uh, Western Canada. they got guys from the Czech Republic, uh, um, like Russia. I mean, I mean, it, it's very impressive who you put together. Yeah, we, we do a lot of... Uh 
we do a lot of scouting, and I, I got a lot of, you know, I played pro for 12 years, so I have a lot of buddies and stuff that are coaching in different places mm -hmm. and coaching in higher leagues and stuff, and I, I'm real friends with a lot of agents, player agents and things like that and stuff, so we get a good um, multitude of players and stuff with different backgrounds and stuff, and, so, and so a lot of times things work out pretty well um, with the fact of us being in Danbury. I mean, Danbury is probably the the class of the Federal Hockey League, so it's it's an easy place to get people to to come and want to play and stuff because it's such a great place to play. Um, it's got a pretty good reputation these days, and and um, you know, so it's not hard with recruiting stuff. It's just getting the right players together. I mean, obviously you've been around long enough now, and you know, in the last couple of weeks, I pretty much changed the whole team to compare yeah. to what we had a few weeks ago. So, and I and I I was standing here before when you were you, you gave us the intro before you were talking to the guy from the Westerners there. Um, and you said we were 15 and 15, and we are we're 15, 12, and three. Sorry. Hold on, that, I gotta so. get this right. Okay, 15, 15, 12, 12 and, three. and three, and three. Those are the those are the ties. Even after you're gonna five you get minute a four, four. Ah, I'm not taking away from you. But at, at the end of the game, if it ends in a tie, then you have five minutes of four on four. Yes. And then you have a shootout. And then we have a shootout. And yeah. it, you can tie at the end of the shootout. It just doesn't. Well, no. Long. But what happens is, is even though you win or lose in the shootout, oh, you get a point. It's still considered a tie. So it's it's I'm pretty. Worried about that. make sure that that record. Okay, so now if you win, if you if you prevail in the shootout, do you get an extra yes, point? Yes, you then? get an extra point. So you get two points you get, for you a get tie. A win, you get you one. You get a win, and then you get an extra point. Yeah. All right. Now it does seem like there's there's a lot of parity in the league. It's the federal. The federal hockey league. Federal hockey league. Yeah. And uh, you have teams in Ohio. You have teams in Illinois. You have teams in uh, well, where? Are well, they? Cape Cod, Massachusetts, which mm -hmm. that team just moved to Syracuse, New York. Um, in the middle of the year here, they were having some issues, so they, they moved to a different They venue. were the Bluefish, and then they turned into the Blues, and now they're in Syracuse? Yeah, they're in Syracuse, New York. What about Marco? What's up with that? Marco, he hitched his wagon Marco to the is, wrong spot. Marco should probably be calling you because he's unemployed again. So. Marco. Marco's headed to the New Jersey Devils, last I, I, I spoke to I him. don't know about that. I we'll think he see. got a ticket to the game. That's about I, it. Either you know that or it's, they needed the locker room cleaned or something. <laughs> One or the other. But, um, you For know, social life alone, Marco should have stayed right here. He I, was building I, something. He was. He was He was all over over the nightlife here. All right, <laughs> 15, 12, and 3. And uh, what do you see for the rest of the year? Well, right now we're in third place. We're, mm -hmm. we're, um, we're, we're, we're in a really good position because we have, uh, for some reason, I don't know how, how it happened or something, but we have like we have like four or five games in hand on the first place team. We have, you know, like eight or nine games on the second place team, and we're sitting in third place right now. So we have a lot of games in hand, a lot of points to, to, to still make up. And, um, you know, I... Like I said, I revamped the team. I got a lot of veteran players. I just brought in back again. We got a couple of guys that were here last year that are on their way back. And um, we've kind of revamped the team from a rookie team where we were doing pretty well, but we were we were blowing leads and stuff in the third period just because we were, you know, we had a young team. I had 13 rookies, mm -hmm. and we were making dumb mistakes and stuff in, in the third period, and we were blowing. We blew a couple of games, probably about five or six games we blew in the third period. And, mm -hmm. and it, you know, it just happens because those guys are learning and stuff. And we got to the halfway point through the season. Season, and I just decided that it was time for uh, for a change, and there was a lot of guys available. And then the NHL lockout ended, ended, so a lot of guys there was an opportunity for for guys to move again, and, and and guys to go up, and guys to go down. And we lost a couple of good players that got called up. It's interesting because yeah. there's a bit of a pecking order. And by the way, the phone number here is four three eight two thousand three. If you have a question for the coach, he's right here. He'll answer it live, so don't hesitate to call in. Um, but it, it does seem as if there's there's a bit of a pecking order where. The NHL, if they're on strike, people scatter. Yeah. I mean, I was up in Canada over the, over the holidays. They got a lot of hockey on TV out there, yeah. and you're watching the Swiss League, the Russian League, and you're yeah. seeing all the guys and go, "Yeah, that guy plays for Boston, or that guy plays for the Flyers." So they scatter. Yeah. And does that does that uh, sort of push down the talent into these other leagues? And, and yeah, that's pretty much what it did. Is it, it, we had a lot of really good players playing on our team mm -hmm. the first half of the year here that probably wouldn't have been in this league had the NHL started on regular basis like they should have. Right. Um, so when they when they and the lockout ended and they had their training camps, they pulled up a lot of guys and a lot of guys that were in the East, uh, the American League went up to camp and then a lot of guys in the East Coast League went up to American League and you know just kind of bumped. So you're kind of you're constantly reshuffling. Yeah, so we're kind of sitting right now in a situation where the NHL training camps are finishing up this weekend because they start the regular season over the weekend here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And within the next two or three weeks, there may be some more shuffling. So I may have some different guys in the lineup again, you know, in the next couple of weeks. So do you get paid a commission for every deal you make? Because if you do, you'd be a millionaire. I, I wish I did because, you know, I wish I got paid for, for having guys called up because last year we led the league. We, I, we had 40 guys called up over the course of the season last year. And the year. next tier up is Elmira, right? Well, yeah, the East Coast League, the okay. Elmira 
for us, it's pretty much it's Elmira Jackals, the Trenton Titans, you know, in Trenton, New Jersey, and mm -hmm. uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, the Wheeling Nailers and stuff. So that, that's where I spent, sent the majority of the guys last year. It's almost like a catch-22 because the better you do, the way you showcase your talent, the the more opportunity they have, and if they if they you know look too good, they get snapped. Yeah, it's 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 a double-edged sword down here, you know. Yeah. Like I I do my job, you know, with, with the with trying to keep the Danbury Whalers team winning games and stuff to keep the fans, you know, behind us and things like that and stuff. Yeah. But then sometimes when we get that right mixture and players start to do well, I, I wind up losing them. But that's the other part of my job is to develop players and get them out of here, you know. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm looking to get out of here myself and, and, and get higher up in the, in the coaching ranks, obviously. And the way I'm going to do it is by developing players because if you don't develop players down here, then they're not going to give you that next shot. So, so. you you're, you want to make a career of this. Is, yeah. This is like uh, you'd like to eventually uh, – uh, coach in the AHL, the East Coast Hockey League, and then maybe get a shot at the Maybe, NHL. yeah. I mean, I have a lot of buddies and stuff that are coaching up there and assistant coaches in the National Hockey League. And yeah. and they're all guys that I played with, obviously, and stuff. And this was my goal when I when I played for, for as long as I did with yeah. playing pro hockey was to get to the, the National Hockey League as a player. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. So now this is another avenue. So we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll see Well, that. a lot of people may not know. He, uh, um, uh, Phil actually played for uh, West Point in, during his college years and then went on to the the East Coast Hockey League, right? Yeah, playing the East Coast League, played in the, in, uh, um, in the International Hockey League for a little while, and w went to camp m many times with different pro teams and stuff, mm -hmm. and spent the majority of my time in the East Coast League all over the United States yeah. pretty much, lived mm -hmm. in a lot of cool places and a lot of great times I had, so it was, right. it was a lot of fun. Well, listen, okay, let's just talk Turkey just a little bit. I was at the Danville game this past weekend. You guys had a three-goal lead, mm -hmm. and you let it slip away. Mm -hmm. Walk us through the, the, the chat you have with the team between the second and third period, and, and what are your feelings that you're sharing at that time? Well, first of all... Desiree, you're not allowed in the locker room, are you, between the period or anything? You might be a <laughs> no, bit of a disruption. No, sometimes I run up to get a water or something. I wouldn't call it a chat, per se. Yeah, that's not... chat loosely. But... We actually videotaped one of these, and... I and was we, just going to say we, that. Yeah, Personally, go ahead. You've been there a couple of times. You've heard... I cower a little bit. I don't think bit. it's anything that can be broadcasted on this I channel wanna, I want to share with this vast viewing <laughs> audience what goes on behind I, I the scenes. I don't think you could print that without getting in trouble, or, or actually film it without getting in trouble. <laughs> But how do you, what, what are your thoughts that you share with the team at that point? Well, it's just, I, I, you know. I mean, it's got to, all kidding aside, they say that the most dangerous lead in hockey is a two-goal lead. Mm -hmm. A three-goal lead, you got a little insurance there. You just got to hold your own and get the, get the heck out of there with a win, and you let it slip away, it's got to hurt. Well, yeah, it does. And this is the thing that I was talking about before, because right after that weekend there is when I made all the changes. I mean, I cool. I traded three guys. Back up the bus. We <laughs> traded three guys the next morning. So, wow. you know, it was one of those things where, like I said, it had been happening for a while. It, 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 it was going, like, we played really well on Friday night, and we won 4-3. to three. Yeah. And then we played Saturday night, and we had a lead, and then we blew it. And it's just, it's a lot of rookie mistakes. It's a lot of young, inexperienced players and stuff. And, and it's okay to have those those players if, if you're looking to rebuild and you're looking to just kind of keep those guys around for this year and next year and stuff. Right. But unfortunately, we play, in, and I'm coaching in Danbury, and Danbury doesn't really like losing teams. So yeah. it's one of those things where we got to turn it around. I got to figure out how to win hockey games and win them every night because the fans don't want anything else. It is interesting. They have, they have become a little spoiled. I mean, when you get on a winning streak, it seems like the, the arena gets packed out and packed out. But yeah. you lose a couple, mm -hmm. and it thins out pretty quick. Yeah. I have. It seems like I have, like, you know, 2,000 general managers that I have to answer to a lot of the time. So <laughs> yeah, I, go, I go to different places in town here and I get, you know, I spent the majority of my day today being talked to by people about what they want to see and this what they need good. and stuff like that. Funny so. you should mention that because general manager number 53 right now, what's the goalie situation? The you got goalie. Brown, I got right? Brown. Now, Brown's got a resume that just won't quit. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. I mean, goalies are very temperamental. I mean, the ego is a very delicate it's thing a, when you're the a... The goalies are a different breed it, of person. So yeah, I mean, opera singers are prima donnas, but goaltenders, forget about it. It's like fragile. It's like a, it's like a teacup. So how do you handle that? I, I, I think I'm, I'm looking into right now hiring a full-time psychiatrist I think so. that I think that'd be a step in the right direction yeah but um no they, brownie you know brownie's a good goalie he's got he is uh, he's good a big kid he's got a lot of he's got a lot of uh uh, really good qualities as a goaltender. He plays really well and stuff. For I'm not going to blame a lot of the games that we lost on Brownie because you know it wasn't really his fault because he can only do so much. Right. I mean, we had a, a very thin defensive core for a while and stuff, and now I've pretty much uh, revamped that in the last week. I mean, I brought in a, 
I brought in an American Hockey League vet veteran named Eddie Campbell who played here for a while and mm -hmm. stuff. So he's he played for the Danbury Trashers when they were here. So now he's back and he, he he was up in the American League for a long time and now he's just kind of on the back end of his career and he wants to finish out in a place where he where he was before and he liked it here a lot. So he's gonna he's back. I just brought in a six foot seven defenseman named Olivier Shank. A big, big six foot seven. Olivier Shank. Yeah, he's a Canadian. French six Canadian. foot seven. Six foot seven. Uh, he's probably six nine, seven feet on skates. Okay. He's bigger than Pisano. Um, you you know, if you interview him between periods, you're going to need like an extension. They have oh, the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. But, um, you know, so I've basically revamped a lot of things. You know, I, I brought mm -hmm. in a lot of new defensemen. We brought in Mark Vita, another big kid who's pretty pretty good with the, the fisticuffs and fighting and stuff like that and stuff. So I've kind of revamped the whole defensive core. So, I let, you know, I'm real anxious to get on the road tomorrow because I want to see what's going to happen tomorrow night. And then Saturday night, you got Dayton. Demons. Yeah, the first place team in the league. First place. These guys are running wild yeah. over the Federal Hockey League. Where yeah. they, I mean, their record is is pretty phenomenal. Yeah, they're like twenty five or twenty six and three or something. So what like that. are you going to do Saturday night when people lay down their shekels to come into the Danbury Ice Arena? What are they going to see? Well, I, I like I said, I think they're going to see a different team than they played the last time. So. We got a lot of guys in the lineup now. I brought Matt Caranzi back and, and some other guys, and we do a lot more physical. We play a lot more physical now than we have in the past. Okay, now is physical code for there could be some dropping of the gloves? Yes, there probably could be. So that's code, okay. Well, it's not code, but that's what happens when, when you play physical. All right. And when you play physical in this league, you win hockey games. So that's it does seem to coordinate. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting kind of symphony you got to put together because you got to have your goal scorers, you got to have your you know finesse guys with the soft hands. But if you don't have guys that are willing to play physical, yeah, it could be it could be. A and fun. then we got like I said, then we brought in a couple of new guys. We got we brought in the kid Phil Coyne, who's an American Hockey League guy, played mm -hmm. in the American League for a while. He was a guy who had seven points in his first two games that weekend. Oh yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Uh, now we got Kirsch back. So Kirsch is our all-time leading scorer. Now Denver. where was he? Kirsch was uh, he was in school. He decided after last year, he went to camp in the East Coast League this year, uh -huh. and he, he went up there, and, he, and because of the lockout, you know, he kind of got pushed out of there, yeah. you know, because, I mean, Kershaw's a really good player, but when you get up to the next level, there's there's a lot, there's guys that are better than you, you know, so uh -huh. he got pushed out of the East Coast League, and then he kind of got in that mood where players get, and, and everybody's been there, you know, to the point where you try, and you try, and, and you don't get it, and then you're just kind of depressed, and uh -huh. you just say, you know what, screw this, I'm going to go move on, and I'm going to do something else, so right. Kershaw went back to school for a little while, and then at Christmas time you start to get that itch again about you know you start to see your you know your your buddies playing and this that and the yeah. other thing and you're like I only got like a couple more years of this left so I better go back now. So he called you or you called him? Well, it was a little bit of both. I called him a couple of times earlier in the year and right. he was trying to work some stuff out and then um, he kind of gave us a call after Christmas and we we worked out a nice little right. package for him so to get him to come back. Desiree, what do you like best about working with the Danbury Whalers? They're a great group of guys. It's just so awesome to see so many great players that are just so passionate about playing the sport, yeah. the sport of hockey. Sometimes I feel it's underappreciated to, to see the guys play and keep it alive. It's just, it's the greatest thing. I mean, I love everybody I work with. It's been an interesting experience, and the games are amazing. If, guys, if you haven't been out to uh, the Danbury Ice Arena, I would highly recommend coming out on a Friday or a Saturday night. It's a great time. It's just, it's... You're there to watch a great game of hockey. Yeah, and it isn't just like a, some sort of like a glorified bachelor party boys night out. I mean, people come with their, their youth hockey programs that come out, moms, dads. It's like, oh, it's absolutely. kind of for the whole family. Absolutely. We do a lot of great things. There's always Cub Scouts and different organizations of dance teams and cheerleaders and things like that. They're helping us out selling our Chaka Pucks and Webster Whales. They raise money for us and for themselves. Um, it's always a great time. There's a lot of different opportunities. Yeah, the two things you're talking about, this chuck a puck thing is kind of fun. Oh, it's so fun. I mean, so you fun. take a puck, between the second and third period, everyone gets to throw pucks, and there's all these, like, little well, uh, square things. You land on Sports Authority, you get a $100 gift certificate, you put it in the toilet, I think a plumber comes to your house. <laughs> you got, I mean, there's all this, you know, stuff going on. And then there's this whale thing, and if a damn right whaler scores a goal in the first period, everyone throws these plastic whales out there. It's a lot of fun. I mean, you go out there with the kids, and, and I guarantee you they're going to have a, a good time, and it's not that much money, and it's, uh, it's really uh, been a, a real benefit to the whole town. It really has been. I mean, <clears throat> we get, uh, you know, I, and the worst thing about it is, is, the funny part about it is, is when we play some of these teams on the road and stuff, you know, yeah. like we, we've been to Danville and we played in front of like 400 guys and 400 people and stuff like that, and the guys play there and they, they play, you know, they play a good game and stuff, but they're not, they're not kind of, there's a different 
um, like a feeling to the game when mm-hmm. when you play there, and then when yeah. you come back to Danbury, and then when you come back to Danbury and you play that same team, it's almost like the the away team feeds off of the fact that they're finally playing in front <laughs> yeah. of like three thousand people. But they're our fans. They're yeah, supposed they're, to feed yeah, us, yeah, not them. But, you know, and we for some reason we have like. The really we have the best games in Danbury because I think some of those guys come in there and they you know when they skate out for the first time and they see the place is packed yeah. I mean it kind of you know sends a feeling through their body and then they wind up playing that much they kind of like rise to the occasion almost and they play really really well for some reason on the road against us I mean yeah. so it's like that like a lot the, like the Kansas City Royals coming and playing at Yankee Stadium yeah. you know they're yeah. like whoa this is the house of you know, yeah. and, they have, you know and the funny thing about parts. it is is I get all the time like during the game or after the game when I'm walking off the ice or whatever, I get guys telling me from the other team, I want to come here, I want to come here, I want to come here. All so, right. I mean, but it's just, you know, so it's just one of those things. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I mean, I, 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 my, my wife, okay, I'm going to blame my cards on the I married a Canadian because genetically I wanted to create a hockey player, I, which I did. He, <laughs> he's now in the Navy Special Forces, so uh, his hockey career was short-circuited a little bit, but uh, that was the plan. Um, but we went, we went out to the game last weekend. We went to the parking garage across from the rink. I think it's like five stories tall. You could not get a parking place. The whole place, you get in the rink, and, and it's just absolutely packed, and it's a lot of fun. We're yeah. very lucky great. to have the fan base that we do. We attract a lot of people, all different ages, all different interests. It's just, they really contribute, I'd say, to at least half the game is the fans. What's a hockey game without a packed <laughs> arena, really? Yeah, and it's great. I mean, great, I mean, if you're into, you know. 70s rock and roll. I mean, they got, they got, they got a great uh, disc jockey there that spins all the records. And then in between the second or first and second period, they usually have a youth hockey team. So there's like about 28 little mites out there skating around. And it's really, uh, it's really a lot of fun. Okay, now, okay, we, uh, get the record straight. It's 15, 12, 3. <laughs> yep. Fair enough. Yep. We're halfway through. Yep. You're making the adjustments. If this is the movie Slapshot, it's kind of like the last game. You're getting these guys, you know, McGursky and, you know, guys out of prison. And Okay, I'm, I'm joking about that, not out of prison. But now we're going to see maybe for the next half of the, the, the season, maybe a little rougher style. What do you expect to happen? How do you get this team ready to make that push in the playoffs? Well, like I said, with the moves I made now, I think we've, we've done that. I mean, I, if you look at, and I did this the other day because I'm, I'm kind of anal about things like this and stuff, but last year um, at this time at the same mark, we were actually a little bit behind where we are now. So And you made it to the finals last year. So, I, I, like I said, I think we're in a real good spot right now. Um, we're a little bit ahead of where we were at this time last year, and, and, and I just brought in some some players and things like that that are a lot better than some of the guys we had at this point when, that we made the changes last year. So I I think going down the stretch here, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make a push, and we play four games in four nights this weekend. We leave tomorrow morning to go to Thousand Islands up in Watertown, New York. Mm-hmm. Then we come back and play home Saturday, Sunday, and then on the holiday on Monday. Um, so we have four games in a row. So that's you know three three points a game, and mm-hmm. and. Uh, it's a chance to get 12 points this weekend, and and if we do that, we're going to make a jump right up in the standings. So, um, you know, that's my goal for this weekend, and that's where we're at. And that Saturday night game against Dayton, that's got to be one you circled early, right? I yeah. mean, that's going to be a tester. That's yeah. going to be if you can if you can get one against them. Well, this is the thing. That's we've played a big them. Deal. We've played them a couple of times already this year. They beat us twice, and then we lost one time in a shootout. And, um, you know, like I said, now I made these changes, so I want to see where we're at now, where we stand at, uh, at them against on Saturday night. Um, you know, like I said, hopefully I'm planning on winning that game on Saturday night. So, um, As a coach, is it better to be loved or feared? I think there's a there's a balance in between there. And, and I, I, I don't particularly I, – I mean, I will say this. I don't particularly want to be friends with my players, but I also don't want them to hate – you know the whole aspect of the way I am and things like that and stuff. So, so you got like in football, you got a Pete Carroll who's kind of a rah rah guy. Hey, you want to go to Chuck E. Cheese after the game? <laughs> and then you got a Bill Parcells who's yeah. like, listen, get out of here, you kicker, you miss this kick, get on the bus because yeah. I'm getting a new kicker in here. Yeah. Where do you fall on the spectrum? I, I think I'm anyone more, go to Chuck E. Cheese after not, a game with not you? Not with me. So, okay. I mean, I think Desiree will tell you a couple of times after games in the locker room and stuff that things didn't go so well. So. Phil, I think you're halfway. You're in fact, you're a little bit of both. You're a perfect combination of both. <laughs> there we go. See? The yang, the yang, you know, friends with the guys. I, I think the, the problem here is is that usually usually in, in higher leagues and stuff, and especially once you get to the American League and the, and the NHL, 
that there's the head coach and then there's an assistant coach. And the assistant coach is kind of like the happy, go, rah, rah guy, the, yeah. guy, the middle guy between the players and the coach. Yeah, I've noticed and then, that. And then like there's a position the coach, coach. And then there's the coach that is the head coach, and he's the guy yeah. that kind of everybody stays away from. Right. You know, and you don't you, like you just don't want to talk to that guy because if you're going to talk to him, then you know something's bad's going on. So, okay. You know, but I don't have that luxury, so I kind of got to like do two roles. I got to play both roles. All right. What works better? Do you, do, does chemistry beget winning, or does winning beget chemistry? I mean, if you want to have chemistry, if you want to have camaraderie, I think you got to. Like the broad sleeve bullies, you know, the Philadelphia Flyers, they would they would say, you know, Schultz and them. Uh, they would say, oh, yeah, we'd be out drinking every night, you know, we had a real good chemistry, and we just had this camaraderie, and we knew we couldn't get beat, and it was us against the world, and that yeah. really worked for him. Yeah. Do you get that, or is it kind of like, well, just I, get the I talent think, out there, and I it's going to work? I think you've got that now, and you you got to have the chemistry first, because when you have the chemistry, and you have guys that are willing to to lay their body on the line for the, for the next guy and stuff, and for, for their teammates and stuff, that that's a big part of winning hockey games, and a big part of having a championship team. I think the difference now is, is from what you're talking about, is, is the whole aspect of hockey players is totally different now. I mean, guys aren't out of shape anymore like they were back then, oh, yeah. you know, drinking every night and stuff. Guys are in tip-top, you know, physical condition, and they do nothing except worry about what they eat and work out and, and are constantly on top of that. I mean, so the, the going out and drinking, yeah, it happens and things like that and stuff, but it, it doesn't happen as regularly as what you were talking about. So hmm. it's a totally different athlete now. It's a totally different scenario, and these guys are here because they're trying to get out of here. They're trying to make a living making playing hockey. You know, they're trying to get to a point where they're making – you know, serious money to play hockey. So it's yeah. it's it's a it's not a just a pastime anymore. Now it's a it's a conquest. It's like a you know it's a it's a it's a job. Now when you talk to some of these guys and you, you say and guys are coming and going, when you talk to someone, does it will it at some point end their hockey dream? Say, look, you know you're gonna get you're getting cut by the Danbury Whalers. You know, there, there there aren't like three or four other leagues below this. You know, you're looking at beer hockey on Thursday night. Well, that's the, 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 the difference. is, it, And that's the weird thing, too, because up until about probably about four or five, six years ago, there was no single-A hockey league. Yeah. So there was just there was the NHL, the American Hockey League, and then the East Coast Hockey League. Right. So if you, like, that's the way, when I was younger and I played, that's where, where I was. I was in the East Coast League. Yeah. But there was no single-A hockey. There was no Danbury Whalers. There was no Southern Pro Hockey League like there is now where there's yeah. 10 teams down south. Yeah, like the, and, the Louisiana Ice yeah, Lizards yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, all those. So, I mean, the worst part about it was is you would go to camp on the East Coast League, and if you didn't make it, you had nowhere to play. So you just spent the whole year not playing until yeah. next year until you tried out again you know so it this is the good thing about our league is now we have a single a hockey level and there's a place for these guys to play otherwise they wouldn't be having somewhere to play at all yeah. and um you know it's just you know one of those those nice scenarios where you know it's a it's a league you get paid for it to play hockey you know you're having a good time but you also have the ability to, to play well and get out of here and get a chance to play at the next level without having to sit around all year what about what about some of the leagues in Europe you know you look at some of the hockey database on some of the players on your team they have played in like London or yeah, Belgium Netherlands, or Netherlands yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean how do those there's compare a, there's a lot of good, they, they're kind of like something close to the East Coast League and things like mm-hmm. that and stuff so they're they're you know they're kind of comparable. The difference between over there and over here is is there's the rough the rough play and stuff. It doesn't happen over in Europe. It's a I mean, there's big no, wide yeah, open it's a big surface. Arena. It's an Olympic size arena. It's a lot bigger than the arena we play. Everyone's it's a wide got open. shields on. Yeah, it's a wide open a wide open game. There's hardly any checking. There's definitely hardly any fighting. You know, it's a, just a different, totally different game over there. But the guys go over there because it's a good place to play. And, yeah. you know, you get to see the world. And, and it's like I said before, you know, I played for 12 years and I lived in a lot of different places. Like, Did I you lived, ever play in Europe? No, I never. never. I, my style of game wouldn't have worked over in Europe. <laughs> so uh, I never got the opportunity to go over there. But I made a career doing that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I did it for 12 years. And if I didn't do it, I wouldn't have played probably. So, yeah. you know, but I lived in a lot of great places. Got to travel the world and, 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 you know, the country and live in a lot of places in the United States. So it was nice. All right. Uh, Desiree, what do you uh, what do you like best about uh, what you're doing, and what do you see for the rest of the season as well? What what can people expect when they come out to the arena, and how do you see this coming together? Well, what do I like best? Yeah. I've been learning so much about the sport in general. I thought I knew everything there was to know for now a girl. you grew up in New Jersey. I did grow up in New Jersey. Now, did you have brothers, uncles, dads that played hockey? Did you wander no, around the rinks actually, as a kid? I grew up like in East Rutherford, New Jersey, so I grew up down the street from Giant Stadium and the IZOD Center, so my whole life went to Devil's Games, oh, watching the game since I'm six. So I thought I knew everything there was to know about hockey. And so <laughs> coming here, getting to know coaches and players more personal than I did yeah. working for the NHL. All-time favorite Devil, who was it? Scott a, Stevens, no doubt the guy could I gotta hit. say Marty, because he's not just Martin a Martin Brodeur? Yeah. 
He's a good goalie. The only problem with Martin 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 what was it? 1940. Now it's 1944. Yeah. No, I know, it's terrible. Devils don't have nearly as much as Same thing with the Islanders. Deserve. The Islanders put four in a row together a couple decades ago. Still, no love for the Islanders. They can't get fans out. They got to move to Brooklyn. And New Jersey Devils, you guys have trouble. I don't know. You're at the, the Rock now in, in Newark. Yeah, right? that's in Newark. It's a beautiful arena. I'm not too, wasn't too crazy about the location change. Yeah. Because for me, it was going down the street to going 40 minutes to Newark. Yeah. But I mean, they deserve the place they play in. It's a beautiful arena, completely built built for the Devils. It's a Devils uh -huh. arena. It's just gorgeous. I'm happy that the guys are there playing at such a beautiful facility. Yeah. Um, it just, I feel it doesn't get the fan base that the guys deserve. That's the only thing. It is, it is kind of funny how they are. Like in, in New York, there's a top tier and a, a secondary tier. And, and I mean, basically the top tier is the Yankees and the Mets are the JV. And same thing, the Rangers are like, yeah. you know, they, 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 they're sold out every night. And yet you got the Devils and you got the Islanders and they're, they're better teams if you want to look at Stanley Cups or however you want to look at it, but they just don't have the cachet that the Broadway bullies do. It doesn't seem Fair. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So, what are you, what are your plans? Uh, you know, as far as uh, working in sports and working in media, what are you what are you planning on? Well, doing? just like Coach Espo said, for him and the guys, they're mm -hmm. there because they want to advance to bigger leagues, bigger and better things. Uh -huh. You know, for me, I look at this as an opportunity. I'd love to be with the Whalers as long as I can, but. I have goals. I, just like these guys, I hope to, to end up in the NHL as well. There you go. But you got to be careful. Marco is a cautionary tale, don't you think? Yes, he is. He jumps. He thinks he's, you know, grasping the golden ring, but now look at him. Yeah. I, I he's, know out, he's out, and he's on, on, the, on the unemployment line right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I, I got him on speed dial. I should probably call him up. You should. Um, okay, let's talk turkey about guys. I like guys like Frazier. Yeah, I mean, he seems. Is he is he still on the team, or did Frazier's you give him a did you give him a butt anywhere. ticket? You can't get rid of Frazier. Well, Frazier's not going anywhere. Okay, so he's hanging. I mean, Frazier's he's, a utility guy. He does everything. He's Anything like a little like Corey uh, Fulton. Corey Fulton. Now yeah. is he still around, or what's Corey's he doing? not anymore. He he uh, he went Hung down up the blade. No, he, he went down to Huntsville. He's playing down Huntsville in the Southern Pro League. Okay. He um you know we we kind of had a situation here where I had to make a decision about. You know, keeping a guy like Corey or getting somebody who can actually, you know, not that Corey couldn't play because he could, but I, I couldn't use him on a regular shift, I, mm -hmm. I felt. So, you know, I, I kind of not pushed him out, but just kind of went in a different direction. And, and we went with a guy like Frazier. Now, Frazier does the same job that Corey did. But now, Frazier's from, like, Western Canada, Yeah, he's, right? from, he's a Western Canadian boy, and, okay. and those are, those guys are tough out there. They're big did farm boys. Did he grow up boys. on a yeah. – yeah. He grew up in Calgary, yeah. I believe, right? So, yeah, yeah. They're, they're big, tough farm boys out there, so – you know, he came in, he, he does the same job as Corey pretty much, and he, but at the difference between Frazier and Corey is his Frazier plays defense, Frazier can play forward, I mean, he, he does yeah. it, pretty much does everything, so um, he's one of those guys that's not going anywhere, I mean, he's going to be here for the year. Now, as far as you got Nieder and and you got uh, Brown as Brownie, goalies, yeah, right? Yeah. Now, are you platooning them at this point, or do you go with the hot hand? No, uh, I'm, uh, I'm kind of just going, uh, I'm just kind of going along the roll. Like I said um, with before, I'm not really putting too much emphasis right now on us losing games because of goaltending because I don't think that's the you case. You can't do that. You no. can't blame it on no, them because I, you win a lot of games yeah, for the goaltending yeah, too. I don't, I'm not, like I said, there's a difference between bad goaltending and goaltenders you know, losing games because of defensive mistakes or forwards yeah. not doing what they're supposed to do because they're making dumb mistakes and things. So my goaltending, you know, I think right now with us going down the stretch, we have the best you know, one-two goalie combination in the league right now because I have both of them. I mean, both of them are starting goaltenders on any team in this league. So, yeah, you know, didn't it's nice uh, to have Brown two play for the? He was in the Bruins organization. Yeah, he got drafted by the Bruins. Played in, in Providence in the American League for a few years. Then kind of just kind of worked his way down. He's getting older now. He's 28 years old. So, uh -huh. <clears throat> Nicky's 29. You know, so they're both older veteran goalies, and I got yeah. both of them. And they're both, like I said, they're both starting goaltenders. I've gotten many calls over the last couple of weeks for both of them. Like the other teams wanting to trade for him and things oh, like really? that and stuff. Yeah. Other team in the federal league. Yeah. Or up well, or? other teams in the federal league, and I've gotten calls for for guys, you know, other guys in the other leagues and stuff, or Nicky and things. So. 
but um, they're happy here. I've talked to both of them, and we're going to go. We're going to go down the stretch here with two guys. So the rest of the year, are we going to are we going to see kind of a defensive style, almost a, a New Jersey Devil trap type thing, a, a very physical game? We're going to see. Is it going to be opened up, run and gun? Well, we're uh, definitely Edmonton I, Oilers of the '80s. Uh, we're I'm just going to outscore you. I'm a big believer in in defensive defensive zone coverage, and I built this right. team this year to play defense. And by the stats that we have right now, we're the lowest goals against average team in the league. So, really? Yeah. Um, what is your goals? Against Our goals against average? average right now, I think, is 114. We're we're roughly somewhere we're roughly somewhere right underneath three goals a game, okay. you know, compared to the rest of the league, which is a lot higher than that and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know, my my goal was to, to build a defensive core that was going to play defense first, and then you know we'll get our three or four goals, you know, a game and win hockey games three one four one, you know, three two stuff like that. And it's worked well pretty pretty much for for so far. But we just had to go out and get another little bit of a scoring punch, which is the reason why I went out and got Kirsch. Yeah, got him back. Yeah, got him, got him, got him. You know, put the put the school books down. And and, you know, come on back. That's good. Yeah. All right, so are you looking forward to the rest of the year? And what I are can't wait to see what the rest of the season has to bring. You know, it's, we're pretty much right in the middle of the season now with the new players and the guys. I, we don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to it. All right, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, too. Like I said, I'll be uh, doing that. Now, where do we have a radio deal, or does this go, like, over the ether or the Internet as far as... It goes uh, on live sports video on the Internet. Okay. And we don't have a radio deal with any radio station, so you can't get the games on the radio. Okay. Um, but we it goes online on, on live sports. Like I said, live sports video, you can go online and watch the game and listen to it at the same time, so it's right there. Um, so if I say anything stupid, there are actually going to be people watching. Yes. Okay. And the good thing about... Unlike um, this coming, show, where you can really get away with a lot. The good thing about coming to the Danbury Arena to watch uh, a game now is, is we have this new thing called Action Audio Apps. Yeah. So it's it's to the point where you I can go there. Got you mic'd up. Yeah, you can go there. I have a microphone on. Some of the players have a microphone on, and you can actually hear what's going on at all times. It's really You cool. have to be over yeah. 18 to get on there because some of the language sometimes gets a little sketchy. So what uh, do you got? You like you buy a headset? And you no, the, you do it right on your uh, your phone there, right on your app. Oh, okay, okay. You can download. You download the app on your phone, on your and iPhone. And you can sit there and listen, sit there and listen to, to what's yeah. going on. Cuss out guys. Each channel is a different and player. And you can change the channels and everything. So it's a, it's a great, great thing to be on. This is a quantum leap in sports entertainment. Unbelievable. It's no, amazing. I, I really wish the NHL or even the NFL did it. It's, I know. it's I, really I mean, cool. I, I use it every game. Sometimes you hear things and words you, you, should, you know your mother shouldn't hear you saying or hear. <laughs> Combination, combinations of things, things. You, should, you shouldn't have. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you coming in. Uh, the team is the Danbury Whalers. They play at the, uh, at the Danbury Arena. If you go to their website, I'm just into Googling. I don't know. It's like danburywhalers.something or other. I don't know. DanburyWhalers.com. You go on there and uh, you can go right down the roster. You can see all the bios on all the players, everything that they do. Uh, you can see all the events coming up. I know this is non-commercial public access radio, so we're not talking ticket prices or anything like that because that would be commercial. What we're talking about is the community value that a minor pro hockey team brings, a community that comes together on, on the weekends when they're in town, which is a lot of games, and they come out for great family entertainment. The Danbury Arena, right down in downtown Danbury, get to the game, bring the family, it's okay. I saw a priest there with his youth group. So, you know, at the Catholic Church, I'm not saying it's an official endorsement, but uh, it's something you can bring the kids out to, too, and enjoy it. Uh, Phil, I want to thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, Mark. And Desiree, you. it's good to have flowers among the thorns, and uh, and it's great to have you as part of the community and what you guys do. happy to be here. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. And we'll see you next week when, uh, would it surprise you if I don't know what's going to be here next week? Hold on, hold on. Uh, yes, there's a libertarian, and we may have uh, some video of my summer vacation, which you won't want to miss. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks a lot for joining us on the Marty Heiser Show, where you always get the truth. And we'll see you here back, see you here next week, 9 to 10 p.m. on Comcast. And if you're in Cablevision or Charger, check your local listings, because I don't know when we're going to be on. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us.